Well, a very good morning to you, and uh, can I extend a very warm welcome to you to our service on behalf of uh, Ferentosh and Rizolis Free Church. This online service is being held in conjunction with the morning service at uh, Rizolis. We're uh, delighted that you're able to be with us, and we trust that we will know God's blessing as we worship in the Lord's name. Our call to worship this morning, the words of Psalm 104, verse 36. Praise be to the Lord Almighty, O my soul, the Lord adore. And we're now going to respond to this call as we sing together the words of Psalm 95. It's the Scottish Psalter rendering, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Come, let us everyone a joyful noise make to the rock of our salvation. Psalm 95 verses 1 to 6 to the praise of God. Well, shall we draw near to God in prayer? Let us pray. O Lord, our God, your steadfast love is boundless, greater than the heavens high. Your faithfulness towards us reaches even to the sky. You are exalted far above the highest heavens. You reign with absolute sovereignty. We praise you, gracious God, for this renewed opportunity to worship you. Although somewhat dispersed and distanced from one another, we can draw near to you and experience a sense of gospel attachment and togetherness with one another. And so we pray that you would bind us together by your Spirit. Fill us with a sense of awe as we worship you, our Heavenly Father. 
We pray that we would, through the lens of the gospel this morning, see something of the majesty and splendour and beauty of the Lord Jesus, our merciful and faithful High Priest. Fill our hearts, we pray, with love and reverence for Christ Jesus our Lord. May we live for him each day, and may our love abound more and more in depth of insight, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. We pray for the ministry of the gospel this morning. We want to remember specifically the congregations of Campbelltown and Stornoway. We pray for your servant, Roger Crooks in Campbelltown. Uh, we pray that you would bless his ministry and we pray for the witness of, of the congregation in that region. We too remember the town of Stornoway and we pray for your servants who minister there, James McKeever and Kenny I. McLeod. Bless them, we pray, and all who reach out with the gospel across the town. We pray for your blessing on all of our congregations. Remember us here in Ferentosh and Rizolis. Keep us committed, we pray, to Christ, our King and Head. Safeguard, we pray, all whom we commit to you this day, those who may be ill, those who may be in need of being upheld, strengthened and sustained by your grace. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would watch over us as we commit one another to you. Grant us to seek security, shelter and safety in your all-sufficient grace at this time. Pardon all our sins, for we confess our wrongdoings, our shortcomings and our failings. We seek forgiveness for all of our sins and all we ask and you is in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, boys and girls, it's uh, so good to have you with us this morning, and uh, I'm uh, delighted uh, that uh, you have uh, joined us. Now, today we're going to speak a little about broken promises. A broken promise can leave us feeling shattered, sad, and betrayed. Maybe you've experienced that. Someone promises you something, but they don't keep their promise, and you feel let down, badly let down. Imagine you receive a letter telling you that you have won one million pounds. All you have to do is call a telephone number you've been given to claim your prize. So you dial the number. It begins with the digits 09. Mm. Half an hour later, you're still trying to get through. Almost an hour later, you get nowhere. Then the line goes dead. And you try again several times over. But you then realise that there is no prize. You've been tricked. You've been misled. You then find out that calls to 09 numbers are the most expensive type of premium rate numbers you can call around £2 a minute. You've lost hundreds of pounds trying to claim your fake prize of a million pounds. A broken promise. This kind of thing happens a lot. You know, I once read of a motorbike enthusiast who paid £2,000 for a motorbike on eBay. The seller promised him free delivery of his new motorcycle straight to his door. He was really looking forward to riding on it. This is what arrived several days later. Yep, a toy model motorbike. He had been hoodwinked, conned. Well, broken promises can have a devastating effect on our lives. I also 
knew a couple who were going to build themselves a dream retirement home. The timber kit to, to uh, build the house required a deposit. So they had to pay in advance around £25,000. The supplier promised to deliver the kit. However, it never arrived. Why is that? Because the supplier went bust. The supplier ran out of money and the business folded. The couple never received any timber. Instead, they were left shattered. Boys and girls, we live in a world of broken promises. And you might be asking today, who do I trust? How do I know that they will keep their word? What if he, what if she breaks their promise? Well, there is one exception to the rule. And that is the Bible, God's word. The promises of the Bible are trustworthy and true. God's promises are always 100% guaranteed. Now today we're going to reconnect with Abraham in Genesis 12. We were there last week. Remember how God tells Abraham to go on a journey? Abraham has no idea where God is leading him. We're going to call this going without knowing. But God promises to be with Abraham. God promises to bless him. And God promises to make him a blessing. So how will Abraham respond? Well, we read, so Abraham went as the Lord told him. In other words, the Bible tells us that Abraham takes God at his word. He doesn't doubt God. He grasps God's promises and off he goes. And he will not be disappointed or let down. So will you dare to be an Abraham and take God at his word? Begin by reading your Bible. Reflect on God's many promises for you. And remember, God will never, ever let you down. And remember this, all of God's promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Safe and secure, trustworthy and true. Amen. Well, let's unite our hearts in prayer as we pray in unison the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now we're going to read God's word together. Turn with me, please, if you will, uh, to the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 12, and we'll take up our reading at verse 1. So we're going to read Genesis 12, verses 1 to 9, followed by a New Testament reading. This is God's word. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram travelled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. At that time the Canaanites were in the land. 
The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went, down, he went on towards the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. Our second reading is taken from the New Testament, uh, the letter to the Hebrews, uh, chapter 11 and at verse 8. Hebrews 11, 8 to 12. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and as countless as the sand on the sea shore. Amen. And we trust that God will add his blessing to the reading of his own holy and inspired word. Well, we're now going to engage with the our reading from the book of Genesis chapter 12. Now, last week we began a series on the life and faith of Abraham. We're calling it simply exercising faith. Now, last week we began by focusing on Abraham's calling and his commission. We focused primarily on verses 1 to 3. Today I'd like us to focus on verses 4 to 9, again under two headings. Abraham's submission and Abraham's devotion. So let's begin by focusing on Abraham's submission. Let's begin with this question, how does Abraham respond to God's calling? Well, look at verse 4. So Abraham went, the Bible tells us, as the Lord had told him. Now, there is nothing to suggest that Abraham questioned his calling, that he hesitated, that he faltered. There is no evidence whatsoever of time-wasting or resistance on the part of Abraham. He simply submits to God. His submission is immediate. Now notice here that he is told to go, and he goes. He leaves Ar, he's led to Haran some 600 miles away. This man of faith, as Paul refers to him in Galatians 3.8, goes with immediate effect. One writer refers uh, to Abraham's uh, uh, departure here as prompt obedience grounded in faith. And it absolutely is. Now, not everyone on the pages of the Bible uh, responds to God's calling with submission. Remember, Jonah did the very opposite. He resisted God's calling and he rebelled. Instead of going to Nineveh, this runaway prophet made for the Mediterranean Sea. But remember, it didn't end well for Jonah. Neither will it end well for you and I. Now, we may not be swallowed up by a large fish as a result of our disobedience, but God will show his hand. The words of Proverbs 21, 30, there is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. Jonah learnt that to his cost, and so will you and I if we resist God's calling. 
So when God speaks, we would all do well to listen. Just from a personal perspective, in 1998, I was uh, conscious of a growing sense of calling to ministry. However, I faltered, I hesitated, I put off. That is until I read the words of Second Chronicles chapter 13, verse 12. Do not fight against the Lord, for you will not succeed. Well, needless to say, I submitted my application without further delay. Now, perhaps God's word is prompting you today to submit, to finally submit, to respond to God's calling in your life with obedience. Perhaps it's time to stop dithering and delaying and deferring. Well, follow, if you will, in the footsteps of Abraham. Now look at verse 5 here. Notice that Abraham is not alone. Notice that he's accompanied by his wife Sarai. She stands by Abraham and supports him. Now God has a plan and a purpose for Sarai as well. Now this will unfold later, but the important point here is that she goes with him. Would Abraham not have shared his his calling with her? Well, whatever was said, it's apparent that Sarai also responds with a spirit of submission. She will she'll accompany her husband. She may have more questions than answers, but she will go. She trusts Abraham and the God of Abraham. And they both begin this journey in unison, fueled by faith. Again, remember the words we read in Hebrews 11, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go. And he went even though he did not know where he was going, going without knowing, but by his side and right behind him with their full support at this stage is his wife who shares in this exodus exodus moment of uncertainty for both of them. Nonetheless, they both go in submission to God's calling. And isn't it interesting, when God calls, he may well bring others with us on the journey. Not as reluctant passengers, but as gospel partners to bolster and encourage us in our Christian service. It may be a spouse, it may be, a, it may be family members or friends or colleagues, workmates, brought together in the providence of God to serve with us. When we read the Gospels, we see how Jesus called the twelve and in Mark 6 began to send them out two by two. Look at the missionary activities of the early church. Peter and John work in gospel partnership, as do Paul and Barnabas and Paul and Saul. But the the Old Testament is no different. Think of Moses and Aaron, or Moses and Joshua. Uh, Think of Esther and Mordecai. Think of many others who work in unison with one another. But it's not just Sarai. There is reference here to Lot, that's Abraham's adopted son or his nephew, uh, who comes along as well. You know, the words of Psalm 110 verse 3 really do echo in the background as we, as we read this narrative. The psalmist says, your people offer themselves willingly. In other words, they volunteer freely, they serve gladly in the day of your power. So Lot follows in Abraham's steps of faith. Will you do that this morning? Notice 2 verse 5, the people they had acquired set out with them, servants, herdsmen, they all accompany Abraham. Let's call this the ripple effect, this spirit of submission that we see in Abraham. We see it in others around him as well. Now, 
uh, as, we, as we journey with Abraham, we, we notice that, that there has been a stopover in Haran. Now, it's, it's merely a pit stop. But I do wonder, might Abraham have thought that he had reached his destination? Um, when we read chapter 11, verse 31, we read that they settled there. Now, uh, you might say, is this not far enough for a 75-year-old and his ageing wife? Well, no, not from God's perspective. God's calling for them equates to an onward journey. You know, God may at times take you and I to crossroads and junctions in our lives, and there we have the opportunity to pause. He may call us out of one mission field, out of one ministry scenario, and lead us into another. The key is to wait upon the Lord. And Abraham does just that. God says, go, Abraham. And we read in verse 4 here that he went. Now, the word went can also mean to follow. In other words, he followed. God says, go. God begins to shepherd him. And Abraham follows suit. You and I are to wait until we hear God's voice saying to us, off your feet, go. We have to wait patiently, prayerfully, receptive, uh, sensitive to God's voice, calling us how we need the ear of Samuel. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Well, let's move on to Abraham's uh, devotion. Because uh, not only do we see submission, but we see uh, devotion in, 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 Abraham's, uh, in Abraham's life. He, he journeys on. He devotes himself, doesn't he, to the Lord. He's led to the land of Canaan. Uh, he's led, more specifically, we read here in verse 6, to the site of the great tree of Moreh. Why is this mentioned? Why is it so significant? Well, interestingly, the word more means teacher. So this was probably a, a pagan site for reading and reciting Canaanite oracles. There, in, the, in, in this region, the, the people worshipped a moon god. But God sanctifies this spot by appearing to Abraham. Here, Abraham will be taught the oracles of Almighty God. Now, the symbolic significance of this is quite remarkable in itself. Here, the Bible highlights very clearly that God is able to transform a site, a location, a community, a country, a nation from darkness to light, from, from being extremely secular to becoming spiritual. Think of the highlands of Scotland, not unlike this great tree of Moray. The highlands were once distinctively pagan until the transforming, reviving, reforming power of the gospel swept across the region in our recent history. Look at verse 7. God speaks here and says, to your offspring, I will give this land. Now, think of this from Abraham's personal perspective. There are two major obstacles here. His wife is barren. Chapter 11, verse 30, she had no child. And the sheer number of Canaanites everywhere you look who are clearly preventing Abraham from settling in the land. So how will Abraham respond? With, with utter disbelief? Does he, does he think, right, this is the moment where I engage in a damage limitation exercise and I retreat, I'm going to return to Ar? No. Look at verse 8. He builds an altar. Now, this is not a spontaneous uh, build, but a purpose-built altar altar that's been raised with, with reverence, with devotion, driven by a, a spirit of worship, and it's dedicated to the Lord. In a word, 
he he consecrates uh, the promised land to God and acknowledges in this moment that what is impossible with men is possible with God. Now, sometimes God's calling is not without obstacles. Faith will be tried, faith will be tested. So what about you this morning? There may well be hindrances and hurdles to overcome in your Christian life. Difficulties and dilemmas often test our resolve and challenge our faith conviction. Now Abraham's descendants, the children of Israel, will discover that the moment they enter Canaan, the Jordan River, the, the, the city of Jericho, and many other obstacles will, in no uncertain terms, test their faith. Now, how are such obstacles to be overcome? Well, there's only one answer to that question, by trusting unreservedly in the Lord, which is precisely what Abraham does here. And this is highlighted, of course, for our encouragement. Again, verse 8, Abram moved on from there and then pitches his tent between Bethel and Ai. Again, with devotion, he will build an altar and he will call upon the name of the Lord. Notice the pattern here. He, he presses on and then he stops, as if to say, to persist, I need to pray. To persevere, Abraham must commit the next, the next leg of the journey to the Lord. So he prioritises prayer. The altar and prayer go together, dovetailed as one. He commits each leg of his journey here to the Lord. He prays for grace to fuel his faith so as to journey on. And doesn't he lead by example as we close this morning? God's work necessitates prayer, doesn't it? Abraham's throne of grace is ours as well. It is here that we receive, as Abraham does, mercy and we find grace to help in our pressing time of, 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 of need. Abraham is learning here in these early days of his pilgrimage to rely on God and what a learning curve it is for him. Notice that he places emphasis here on the name of the Lord, Jehovah, the God of covenant faithfulness. You know, Martin Luther once said, I have so much to do that, that, that I shall have to spend the first three hours of my day in prayer. Well, how we would do well to adopt this spirit of submission and devotion in our own lives. God is faithful. The words of 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, so, so pivotal to my own personal calling to ministry. Faithful is he who calls you, he will surely do it. Verse 9, and Abraham journeyed on. He's still going. What about you? Hebrews 11.10, Abraham was looking forward to the city that has foundations, unlike the ruins of Babel, whose designer and architect and builder is God. May God grant us with with the spirit of Abraham this day, to look to Jesus, the author, the perfecter of our faith. Amen. And we trust that God will add his blessing to these thoughts, these reflections on his word. Now we're going to conclude our service this morning as we sing to the praise of God the words of Be Thou, my vision. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, to the praise of God.
Let's bring our service now to a close with the benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit remain with us all. Amen.